Welcome to Cambodia Business Week. Uh, another special Saturday show for you today. Uh, today we have a very special guest again. I'd like to welcome you, Mr. Jayant Menem from the Asian Development Bank. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for thank you for coming, uh, Jayant. Your I call you Jay. If that's okay. That's fine. Your uh, role at the uh, Asian Development Bank is uh, lead economist, trade and regional cooperation. Right. Okay. It's a mouthful. <laughs> did I get it right? <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> There's a little bit more here, but we'll. Uh... <laughs> no, no, no. That's enough. Yeah. <laughs> okay. First, can if you don't mind, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Where are you originally from? Okay. Right. Uh, oh. Personal stuff. Right? Personal yeah, stuff. First. Okay, let's start with that. We got to yeah. get familiar with you. We got to get comfortable oh, with okay. you. <laughs> okay, sure, sure. This is easy for me. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'm uh, Malaysian by birth. Uh, grew up there until I was about 16, 17 maybe. Yeah, and then went to finish my high school in Australia. Australia. Yes, that's right. So you have a very British accent. Oh wow. Well, okay. <laughs> well, that's a combination of things. I okay, think yeah. uh, I was in Melbourne in Australia, but the Melbourne accent is a bit more, uh, less, tw- well, a bit less twangy than the other bit parts of uh, Australia, maybe. Yeah. Um, anyway, so I finished my boarding school and university in Melbourne. Yep. Did all my studies there, and uh, worked there as well. So my first job was also in Melbourne. Uh, at Monash University um, in a research center. Um, Can I ask you what you studied at school? Oh, uh, right. I did uh, economics, basically. Yeah. What yeah. made you want to be an economist? <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> actually, I started my first degree uh, doing accounting and economics, right? Thinking, you know, accounting will give me a career if I would stop there. And I found accounting extremely boring. (laughs) I I have an accounting degree. (laughs) Oh, I apologize to you and to all other accountants who might be out there or studying accounting. (laughs) It was not my thing. That's what I'm sure others uh, get a lot of joy out of it, but it wasn't for me. And I decided to go on to further study as well. And I was interested in uh, development issues. um, And uh, economics provided that opportunity, not accounting. Um, and I worked on uh, trade uh, issues as well, which affects a lot of developing countries. Uh, my PhD was on trade-related issues of that sort. Um, and then uh, I went to work in a research center at Monash. Um, and while I was there, uh, initially I did a lot more technical stuff, uh, large-scale economic modeling and the like. Uh, but because we were a research center, we also did a lot of consultancies to earn our income to pay our salaries. We didn't get much funding from the university because we weren't doing much teaching. We were a research center. And so I started doing consultancies for uh, the UN and uh, ADB uh, and so on. And uh, um, I did a pro- my first project was outside Australia, was on Laos and then on Cambodia, and I really enjoyed what, it. What year was that? Oh, this was 1996. Okay. Yeah, a long time back, yeah. Uh, very different Phnom Penh uh, compared to today. Uh, good and bad. <laughs> sure. I came from the airport today with traffic, uh, right. which I've never seen in, in Phnom Penh in the whole 10 yes. years I've been here. It's just getting that's, incredible. That's one of the bads, yeah. yeah. I think that's the main bad, actually, right. that's... Uh, uh, changed since uh, 97 but uh, of course a lot better restaurants and a lot more facilities now than then yeah uh, but I miss the old Phnom Penh I must say I was uh, quaint and uh, very uh, well, almost unique actually yeah I mean especially coming from Melbourne right to this little sleepy town so 1996 was the first time you, you yes actually, okay. I came here and that was during the Untak days, I guess, right? Uh, actually, uh, the, the first time I was supposed to land in Phnom Penh Airport, I was in Laos. It's a joint project yeah. with Cambodia and Laos. I'd just been running along the Mekong River, and I came back to my hotel room, turned on the TV, CNN, and I saw Ponchen Tong Airport on fire. And I was supposed to catch a flight in three hours landing in that airport. That was when the split had just right. taken place between... CPP and Funzenbeck, yeah, and the fighting had broken out, and of course I had to cancel everything, go back to Melbourne, I couldn't visit Cambodia for the first time, but a few months later I came back to start the project I was supposed to have started, 
uh, on um, Cambodia's impact on Cambodia of joining ASEAN at okay. that time. We'll, yeah. we'll get to that in a minute. I, okay. I like to, um, I, 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 as I mentioned to you before, I was a banker. Right. Uh, and I guess I still am to some degree, but uh, we, these, de- these people understanding what development banks actually do, uh, I think a lot of, some people are confused what that actually is. Sure. So it's, it's different than a commercial bank, obviously, or right. a, here a specialized bank or an MFI. So can you explain to the audience uh, what, what is a development bank or a, what does Asia Development Bank do? Sure. Okay, the question I usually uh, get asked when I first tell someone I work for a bank, ADB, is, say, oh, can I open an account there? I said, <laughs> you can if you're a country. Right, <laughs> Okay, exactly. so our clients are countries, basically, by and large, right? Um, and they're also the stakeholders. They're the owners. They're the owners. Right. So countries participate by... Uh, exactly. They fund the Asian Development Bank. Right, so we've got our uh, donor countries and borrowing countries. They're all contributors as well, and they have shareholdings. They're all owners, but some only uh, provide funding. They don't borrow. These are the richer countries, right? Uh, and the others um, have an ownership, but they're net borrowers. Of course, they borrow, uh, and they also we have both, um, you know, concessional lending, uh, commercial rate lending. But even the commercial rate lending uh, is uh, on pretty good terms, because ADB is a triple A rated agency, and we pass on uh, those benefits uh, in terms of uh, lower interest rates to our member countries, many of which uh, don't have that high rating. Okay. So so countries are, are shareholders, and yes. some countries are contributors in terms of the funding. Yeah. Uh, what is the benefit first of being a contributor? Okay. Uh, the benefit, I guess, is playing your role in helping poor countries develop, right? It's part of their aid program. So sort of, is it a philanthropy role in a way? It is. It is aid. It's aid, right? It's aid, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, if you believe that um, the world is made a better place and uh, your own economic prospects depends on other countries also developing, then, you know, it's more than just aid. You're also helping, you know, world economic growth. And if you're a big, rich country like the U.S. or Japan and so on, you need the rest of the world to uh, develop as well, to sustain your own uh, living standards. Now, is this a pool lending or is it country to country still, you know, with the intermediation of uh, the Asian Development Bank? Right. So. Okay, so uh, we receive funds from um, all of these countries and um, we then, uh, you know, design projects and then fund those projects, right? Uh, like I said, a lot of it is lending, some of it are, are in the form of grants, right? So, so it's so grant also? A grant also, yeah, right. they are gifts for the poorest of our countries. Yeah, that's right. But even those poorest countries uh, will borrow for things like, say, infrastructure, right? But if it's a pure social sector thing, right, health, education, and so on, some of those uh, might be concessional, some of those might be pure grants. And and the determination of whether they're grants or concessional is, is by the, uh, there's a government By country, board. usually, by country. Uh, yes, that's right. Some countries are eligible, some are not, uh, depending on, on set of criteria, the most important being, you know, their per capita incomes. Yeah. So grant, grants are one thing, but there's also, as you said, borrowing at very special rates. Sure. So, so what, what types of uh, projects would be funded by right. the ADB? Okay. So we do a wide range of projects uh, covering almost all development sectors, agriculture, uh, health, education. Um, but we do a lot of uh, work in infrastructure. Right, uh, Asia has a huge infrastructure deficit, and uh, we are working towards filling uh, the huge gap there in many countries. And when I say infrastructure, I d- don't mean just roads; it, it includes all forms of connectivity. Talking about airports, airports, ports, ports uh, bridges, ele- electricity or, grids, right. the whole lot. Yes, that's right. Yeah, so it's all encompassing infrastructure. So if I may ask, where's the money coming from and where's it going to? <laughs> okay, so uh, the money is coming from our uh, mainly donor countries. Right, which yes. is the sort of uh, China's of the world, I guess. Okay, so our biggest shareholders, uh, equal biggest shareholders, uh, are the U.S. and Japan, right? Um, and they contribute the most, right? Um, but Japan actually contributes a bit more in non-shareholding funds. Yeah. So if you like, the largest amount of money comes from Japan, but they're equal shareholders with the U.S. 
and they are big as uh, uh, now, donors. Now, the, the Trumpism is uh, sort of hitting, hitting, uh, you know, saying that why are we doing these things? It hasn't that. reached <laughs> us uh, yet. That's surprising. Yeah, which is, that's surprising because uh, he, he's uh, with this America First policy, right? So, right, uh, right. So it, it's, I guess, uh, it's, it's, it hasn't affected the development bank. No, no, it hasn't. That's great uh, news yeah, to hear. That's, that's right. really good yeah. news to hear. Hopefully, in another three years from now, we'll have to worry about. It. <laughs> I said that, by the way. Yeah, you uh, might say that. I can't comment. Yes, right. Yes, so, yeah. so, so, the U.S. is still a, a big partner in this, and uh, Japan, as you said. And where's most of the money going to? Okay, uh, a lot of uh, um, money goes to some of the biggest borrowers, right? Uh, India, uh, Indonesia. Um, Indonesia. Indonesia, yeah, Indonesia is. Uh, Which is now, I think, one of the the sixth largest economy in the world. So they 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 wouldn't be considered. A, like oh, a, they a, have a huge <laughs> population. <laughs> right. A lot of whom are very poor, right? right. In a very remote, uh, in very remote regions. Right. Yes, that's so right. So for infrastructure, yeah. this is like yeah. a country like with seventeen thousand islands. This is, would be a, exactly right. that's right. That's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So and uh, a lot of people still below the poverty line or just above the poverty line, lacking a lot of uh, public. Uh, services and right. essential health, facilities, health, health education. Edu- exactly. Those and health and education is, is the other core sort of uh, tenets, I guess, of, of what you support, right? Uh, we, that's right. But, you know, um, the uh, depends. I mean, uh, it's not just about the money, of course, right? right. Like a lot of the things that we do uh, is in the form of technical assistance, right? So, for instance, China is a borrower, right? China's got the world's largest pool of savings so why are they borrowing from us right they're actually funding the u.s uh, deficit in a large extent right through their purchase of u.s treasury bills sure uh, so why are they borrowing well uh, we we provide a package of services and not just finance right so it comes with technical expertise um, and uh, various other capacity building uh, uh, activities that are tied into the overall project so that's why uh, we have, um, you know, so-called surplus countries also looking to borrow because of the extras that come with the borrowing. And does the ADB uh, borrow uh, itself besides from countries? You know, from countries. Oh yes, yes. yes. So we you go issue out there. bonds. If I, if I, we you have to also Euro Euro raise our own financing. Right. Exactly, oh, exactly. Right. That's right. And that's, that's right. Uh, you're raising funds for uh, eventual grants and for eventual loans that will yeah. be repaid back, and then you repay. Actually. Exactly. That's right. right. So there is a treasury department that manages, um, you know, our overall portfolio. Uh, we can't just rely on the contributions, nor should we that would limit uh, our operations in a great way, in a significant way, to be able to leverage, uh, you know, uh, the lending that we do. And you we do go tri- out to the market. And you said you were AAA rated? Because we are AAA rated. So, and everyone gets our, our lower uh, interest rate cost. We don't, we are non-profit, right. right? So everything is passed on. You can imagine, you know, poor countries, uh, some of them are below investment grade. If they were to borrow, they'd be borrowing, you know, a multiple uh, uh, of the cost that we can borrow at. They get that benefit passed on uh, through to them by borrowing from us. And what, do you, what are some of the current projects uh, that you are funding that, or either grant or by or, or by lending that are uh, pretty sizable and important projects in the Asian region? Oh my God, uh, that's that's a very long list, right? <laughs> what's what's the ones you like? <laughs> no, I mean, what 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 are some of the bigger ones? That are well, uh, given this region, right. I think uh, you know a big program that people might be familiar with is our so-called GMS program, Greater Mekong Subregion. Right. So ADB has um, a big focus on regional cooperation, subregional programs. So bringing countries together, right? So, you know, these um, uh, huge uh, road networks, you know, running from Myanmar to Vietnam, through Laos and Cambodia, um, you know, running north from China through uh, to the south of Cambodia, uh, the east-west, north-south economic corridors. These are, uh, you know, multi-country, multi-year uh, lending programs that have created incredible connectivity in this region, and, and over this is the very years. important for trade between these countries. Absolutely, right? yes. I think mean, people don't realize just how important it is. For sure, for sure, yeah. and also the is multimodal uh, transport. This is not just um, uh, roads, um, uh, but we have ports, airports um, that they link up to. 
which uh, facilitates trade in goods and services increasingly. Yeah. And what about Cambodia? What what are some of the interesting projects that are going on in Cambodia? Oh, in Cambodia, we have a diverse uh, program. Um, you know, uh, you should get one of our staff from our resident office to give you more details. But we cover, you know, education, health, um, you know, the key social sectors, as well as uh, infrastructure, uh, you know, a lot of uh, road uh, development as well. Right, so Ca Cambodia, I think uh, there's, this con there's this thought that uh, Cambodia borrows a lot or gets grants from China, China helps develop the country. Right. But Cambodia is a is a borrower from the Asian Development Bank. Yeah, uh, we uh, uh, the ADB is the largest multilateral uh, operating in Cambodia. We're bigger than the World Bank uh, or the UN in terms of lending and uh, grant uh, and uh, technical assistance activities. So we uh, have been the largest also for a very long time, and so. Uh, Cambodia is very important to ADB, and we hope ADB is also important to Cambodia. So you you um, you've seen dramatic changes from in Cambodia uh, from 1996 uh, onwards, sure. uh, and I guess what what surprises me as being here 10 years is the acceleration of those changes over the last 24 months. Sure. Uh, and, and you could being here 10 years, maybe the first eight years wasn't you know, developing us fast, but right. it's the incredible pace of uh, development in Cambodia, which is uh, sort of reminds me of the days when we talked about tiger economies being like uh, Singapore, Indonesia, right. Malaysia. <laughs> so this sure. is sort of like the second wave, I guess, or, or even the third wave of a, right. what, what a tiger, econ the smaller tiger economies. Sure. Is it, is, uh, what is attracting people to Cambodia? Okay. Let me just uh, step back a bit. Uh, and pick up on your tiger economy reference, right? right? Yeah, uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, a few of the examples. Uh, you know, when I first came here, um, uh, the Cambodia then, from 96, and reading its history, uh, and looking at what's happened now over this period, um, you know, I think um, Cambo the Cambodian economy is a true Asian miracle, right? If you look at it in terms of uh, change in percentage terms, it has gone from almost nothing, right, where the Khmer Rouge destroyed almost all institutions, right, and look at where it is today. I don't think we've seen this anywhere else in Asia, in this dramatic transformation. So I think, you know, that's something uh, that probably isn't recognized often enough. There's been a remarkable change, right, in the economic condition. Uh, over a relatively short period of time, right? And even if you compare it with the uh, so-called, you know, uh, failed states or, you know, war-stricken nations around the world, I think Cambodia comes out almost the star, if not the star, in terms of how well it's managed uh, its transformation, starting from so little, ending up where it is uh, today, yeah. And it's true, I mean, uh, growth over the recent period has accelerated right shockingly I would say. yeah it's that's just, right uh, you know, yes. 20 the last 24 months has just been absolutely amazing right right <laughs> and maybe you know there's uh, you know uh, concern about sustainability as well and of course as Cambodia graduates um, uh, to upper middle income status the growth the average growth rate will taper down that's what we see and some people refer to it as a middle income trap call it whatever you want, but growth will slow. It's easy to grow fast when you're small and poor, right? right. Yeah, you got a bit of capital added to a lot of labor, becomes very productive, right? But that changes over time, right? Yeah, it can't go on forever, and it doesn't need to go on forever. Yeah. And, it, and I think it's what's it's amazing how the, what the, the talk, the dialogue is now. It's, it's sort of been non pansy and reap. And now we're really talking right. about the outer cities. We're talking about Badabang and we're talking sure. about Mandalkiri. Yeah. I mean, is, is this getting too ambitious? No, I think it's, a, it's the right way to go, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you can see that uh, Phnom Penh itself, right, is now struggling 
to sustain this massive development. We hope it doesn't become another Manila or another Jakarta. I mean, we just get spread out forever. I mean, this, well, this exactly. Would be right. That's right. That's right. So the way to do it is to move it out. Right. Could we move it out to different uh, city centers or oh, another Bangkok, right? Yeah, right. as well. Yeah, I yeah. mean, they just, they, those places go on forever. Yes, they, that's right. And, mm. uh, you know, there's uh, congestion, there's rising costs, right? Yeah. So if you have the good, uh, connectivity within the country uh, working effectively, not everyone has to be in the main city, right? I think uh, most of productive, af- productive activity will take, uh, still take place or increasingly take place in cities, in urban centers, but you need more of them, uh, not uh, expand the size of existing cities, but expand the number of cities uh, where these activities take place. And I think there's some economic challenges, uh, at least being in business here 10 years. Uh, right. what, some of the things that concern me is the, uh, whether there's a sufficient capacity in the labor force, because, right. because you're seeing such growth in the country. Yeah. And you're seeing then such demand for labor. Yeah. You're seeing wage inflation. Right. All right. So is uh, and and Cambodia has um, been always attractive uh, to foreigners. Sure. But it's still it's still um, like you say it, it's there's still that stigma of the old Khmer Rouge. Where people when you talk to people that don't really know Cambodia. Right. Then they say, isn't that? Yeah. It happened 40 years ago. But right. <laughs> but they still have that, uh, that yeah. uh, striking image, uh, which right. is hard to shed, right? right? Yeah. And that is a bit of a curse of history here. But, um, but I think the point you make about the need to focus on uh, education and skill development, skills development, is critical. So we still country. have seventy nine percent of the population is rural. Right, exactly. And there's great yeah. demand in the cities for for labor. Sure, sure. And you, you know, when you've seen your Thailand experience and right. your Indonesian experience, there's a migration of labor. Exactly. Yes. Out of the countryside into the cities. Absolutely, and that will continue. I mean, when I went to the Phnom Penh Special Economic Zone uh, to do a study uh, and interviewed firms, uh, a lot of them, you know, Japanese firms that are paying quite well uh, compared to, say, alternative forms like garment factories, uh, they admitted that they are forced to go out into the provinces now to recruit, right? Anyone in Phnom Penh who wants a job uh, in uh, one of the uh, uh, factories can get one. And they uh, have, have to go out now and have to go out further and further into the rural sector to look for workers. And that's a good sign. Yes. Uh, yeah, really that means people who want to work uh, in these um, uh, factories can find work. And wage inflation here is not necessarily a bad thing. I think it has to be moderated and as much as possible linked to productivity. But, you know, uh, what's development if people don't have better yeah, living yeah, conditions? Sure. Yeah, they need to earn more money to have better lives. But yeah. there's also uh, another trend that uh, is a little worrisome is people leaving Cambodia to work in Korea, Taiwan, to get sure. also to get better wages. Yes, that's right. This so is happening in the Philippines, Philippines, of course, right. yeah, in a big scale. And uh, you can see why they have uh, uh, better incomes, right? But long term, of course, exporting your most precious resource, which is your human capital, is not the way to go forward, not the way to develop, right? Uh, it can be an interim measure, remittances can help um, uh, in improving livelihoods, but it's not the long-term solution. So you've got to create the conditions to make them want to stay at home, work here, and contribute to development of Cambodia. And we're very fortunate to have you here today. So there's, I wanted to mention that yeah. you uh, have you've obviously published some papers that are of great interest. So in the little time we have remaining, can we, can we touch upon some of the uh, published papers that you've done? One is, sure. one is dollarization. Right. Uh, now, Cambodia is a dollarized economy, and the NBC has been uh, ambitiously talking up the possibility of gradually and progressively going to the real. Sure. Uh, how realistic is this in the short term and medium term? Right. Um, uh, this is one of my pet topics. Uh, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, um, my views uh, may not be fully appreciated by the NBC. Um, they are the central bank. They have to be gung ho about de dollarizing. I can understand that. But I think uh, uh, there's no major disagreement, really. Um, I see dollarization uh, here as a symptom, not 
the problem, right? Uh, so addressing a symptom uh, is not the right way to go about solving it, right? Uh, dollarization is a symptom of all the other constraints that Cambodia faces as a transitional economy. And those constraints are becoming less binding. A lot of them are being addressed rapidly. And when they are addressed, you won't have to try and de-dollarize. It will happen naturally. People will prefer to use local currency. Is, is, is there really a reason to de-dollarize? To de is Cambodia need to do it? I mean, it's been one of the, I guess, the um, steady pegs. Yeah. Uh, one of the steady pillars of the economy sure. is the fact that they are dollarized. Right. And Dollarization, in my view, has, as you correctly say, <coughs> I think, uh, worked well for Cambodia, right? It's kept inflation intact. It's uh, been a, a boon for foreign investors. They've seen uh, this as a sign of stability of the value of their investments um, and the ability to you know, repatriate at a given exchange rate, which is one, right, dollar to dollar. So they, have had, they haven't had to worry about volatile exchange rates. I've just come from probably what's one of the worst examples. I, right. I, I was just in Kazakhstan, and uh, right. their currency, uh, I guess, devalued like two or three times over the last... Uh, sure. This is a very wealthy country in terms right. of resources and yep. oil and gas, and, and it's, uh, it's really had such a severe impact. On, sure. And it's a rich country. Yeah. So, in a sense, right. uh, dollarization, if you look at what's happened with some of these other developing economies, right. I mean, Indonesia, the rupiah is, is went from 8,009 to 13,500. You know, sure. Right. Malaysian ringgits. I mean, it, yeah. Cambodia has probably stood out as uh, because of being dollarized. Yeah. It, it has <laughs> benefits and it has costs, right? right. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, my view is that um, in uh, Cambodia, in the long run, when, as long as they don't try and enforce de-dollarization, right? Try to uh, fix the problem by legislating it. As long as they don't do that, if it happens naturally, then Cambodia will be better off having its own currency. The central banks uh, can earn seniorage, uh, and um, if they're disciplined about their printing presses um, and don't go, um, you know, financing huge deficits by printing money. Uh, only the U.S. can do that and get away with it because of the central reserve role of the U.S. dollar. Uh, Cambodia won't be able to get away with it. And I think uh, the central bank has shown enough discipline so far anyway and will show that kind of discipline. So they'll be better off. The exchange rate can be an important price. Um, you know, uh, left the vagaries of the international market, it can sometimes go through volatile phases, but usually it reflects underlying uh, sort of imbalances that need to be addressed, right? The exchange rate is an is a, um, um, easier way of adjusting to shocks than the alternative, which is prices or wages, right? Wages is a costly way of adjusting to external shocks. The exchange rate is the faster, uh, less painful way to adjust to shocks. Last uh, topic to touch on is uh, Vision 2050. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll let you tell us what that is. Because, okay. Right. Because that's, that's uh, assuming 32 years from now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, will we be around? Yeah, I don't think Not I me, will. Not me, but you yeah. maybe. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> uh, I think, um, well, uh, I worked uh, with the government, helped the government uh, formulate their Vision 2030 a few years ago which was the graduation from LDC, low, least developed country status, to upper middle income status by 2030. This is um, the next stage, moving from uh, upper middle income to advanced country status or high income uh, country status. Uh, and this is um, uh, very early days of formulating the strategy. Uh, again, this is uh, the Cambodian uh, strategy, not mine, not ADB's, not anyone else's. This is their aspiration. We are here to help, uh, help them any way we can to um, formulate it by providing technical inputs. What would be the most interesting thing if we were alive 2050 that would have been achieved with this vision? <laughs> okay. Uh, well, maybe <laughs> Cambodia won't be dollarized. That's <laughs> probably not the most exciting. Uh, but I think if Cambodia can, you know, uh, eliminate poverty, right? 
you know, many it's, rich which countries. Which has been very successful. It has uh, so far, yeah, exactly. Really has. But there's still lots of people that are just above the threshold, right? Uh, and so um, the not to underplay the tremendous success in poverty reduction, uh, I think there are still a lot of vulnerable uh, workers and vulnerable people uh, that hover close to the poverty line. So, you know, um, again, you know, a bad uh, uh, monsoon or, you know, uh, any kind of uh, shock can push them below the poverty line. Uh, well, with climate change, you'd have and to worry climate about change is droughts. Exactly, and so that's yeah. right. And uh, the point uh, I was trying to make is that, you know, there are many advanced or high-income rich countries that have a lot of poor people, right? Yeah, the U.S. is probably one of the better examples, I'm afraid. Uh, but so if Cambodia can reach advanced country status, high-income status, uh, while uh, preserving uh, a society that has a uh, small, uh, limited amount of inequality, right? Inequality is always going to be there, as long as it's not got huge gaps between the rich and the poor, uh, and um, people have... Um, access to all the basic services that they need, education, health, and etc. And, um, you know, they have um, a living condition that is also fulfilling, right? Uh, which is beyond just the pure uh, material or economic aspects. Um, you know, an environment that's livable, uh, cities that are livable and functional, um, you know, congestion that's under control, um, and um, I think what's important for Cambodia is also uh, international recognition of their equal footing in the world stage. And that's what I think they aspire to. And they often talk about reclaiming uh, their dignity, uh, given their tragic history. Sure. And I think that's all part of uh, the unique uh, circumstance of Cambodia, given its history. And for them, this is an aspiration it's multidimensional and, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, achievable um, uh, at this stage. Uh, but there are lots of unknowns. <laughs> I mean, considering the progress, like we said, the last 24 months, uh, right. 2050 is probably uh, being too uh, negative, I would say. It's probably something that could be achieved in the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, uh, well, I'm sure the government would be very happy to hear you say <laughs> that to them, <laughs> and I hope you're right. Uh, but also, I guess the thing is, um, you know, as you, yeah, as you uh, get richer, uh, you cannot expect to grow uh, that fast. Uh, you know, a three percent growth rate is sometimes considered very good. Yeah, the U.S. No, is we're doing at seven, but, but yeah, uh, that won't go on for. Well, I think they, yeah. they think that um, there's probably a lot of untapped. Um, Pillars. We we don't agriculture for sure has not been the success story that it can be. Sure. As, as, I, as such as it has been in Thailand and there's right. there's a lot of potential here for really getting agriculture finally you know sure. blasting off. That's right. It's still the backbone mm -hmm. of the economy. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's right. And then you you hopefully there is some oil and gas laying around, but who knows? <laughs> okay. Now that uh, that could help or there could be a curse, but right. uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think the transformation of the economy, diversifying. The economy is key right now, um, and we're seeing the early signs of that uh, with, you know, um, manufacturing uh, uh, taking place uh, in the special economic zones, uh, you know, um, with uh, plugging into this global value chains and production networks, and that's where I think the future If you lies. could extend what's, uh, that success story in Thailand and the, the, and the right. Southern Basin, it could be here as well. Absolutely, that, that exactly, that's right. I mean, this is what they call the flying geese model. I mean, yeah. as uh, wages rise in one region, then if the conditions are right uh, in the next country, then they will come. Right. And that's yeah. why infrastructure is so important. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I want to. I want to thank you for coming on. It was a thank you, tremendously yeah. uh, valuable conversation. Uh, I'm sure my viewers it. learned a lot. I enjoyed it and, too. And yeah. uh, I hope to have you back. Uh, have have you back again soon. I'll be thank you very much. Too. Thank you, Jeffrey. Yeah. yeah. And,